story and has achieved what I really think is the remarkable feat of bringing Colossus back to life. Tony is, of course, well known to members of the Computer Conservation Society as founder secretary, now vice chairman, uh, since uh, Hamish Carmichael at the back there uh, has volunteered to take over as secretary to free Tony to concentrate on his work at Bletchley Park, where he's the museum's director. Uh, he's been working, he worked for the BCS for, for some years on its technical committee side, after retiring from a various career, the RAF, MI5, uh, his own computer company, I, I believe, and various others. Some people might think his great distinction is being mentioned in Mrs. Thatcher's favorite bedtime readings by Thatcher. Whether that's uh, a fame you would like to read or not, I'm not really sure. But if you really want to see the stature of the man, go to Betchley Park and see Tony's work uh, in the cryptographic trail there and accumulate, culminating in the, in the working colossus. Yesterday, the BCS, I'm pleased to say, made him an honorary fellow for that work. My pleasure and honor to introduce Tony. Those that remain, 
So 75% of the original uh, buildings remain there, and, um, and those are all the original wartime uh, buildings. Uh, the biggest uh, loss is the, uh, the red building at the top of the top, uh, uh, right at the top there, as well as F block, and I'll talk more about that a bit later on. Um, these are the famous wooden huts, which are not part of our story today. Um, this is hut, hut three over here, and hut six, and hut eight is just at the back over here. And that's hut six. Um, uh, these wooden huts were a job lot from a builder in Guildford. <coughs> they were made of Canadian spruce or pine, and they used some paraffin based preservative on them, the effect of which is to reject all known modern paints so over the <laughs> <laughs> Arithmetic, then you get another character, 
And the, the great uh, uh, magic of this is that if you add this character back to the character there, you get back to the first character. So this is an additive cipher whereby your plain text, when you press A, some machine or some method generates C. And those two are added together by modular two arithmetic, and the result F is then transmitted. <coughs> At the receiving end, F is received, and some machine, which is precisely the same as the machine of the sending end, regenerates C, and adds it back to F again, and then by the magic of modular two arithmetic, um, the, uh, the, that it disappears and leaves you with A again, and reveals the original text. So it's an additive cipher. It's very simple, uh, but it's a very, uh, very powerful technique. And what uh, Gilbert um, uh, Bernam uh, decided to do was to uh, provide uh, uh, punched paper tapes, pre-punched, with random letters on them. Um, and these would be added one by one to the input message and then transmitted. And at the other end, uh, another reel of random paper tape, um, exactly the same, and set to the same start position, would then add the same characters back again and reveal the original message. Now, if you, if you use uh, purely uh, random letter tapes, then that, of course, is unbreakable. Um, but the difficulty is, in a hot war situation, making certain that you've got the same tapes at both ends, that they're set to the same positions, and actually it will actually decipher what you sent. And that's quite difficult. And that's why Gilbert Burnham's system, although it was working in 1919, just at the end of the First World War, was never used quite like that. Um, now, when the uh, German army uh, decided they wanted a, a better and more sophisticated method of communication between their high command, um, they uh, approached the Lorenz Company um, to generate, to, to design a system based on the principles of the Bernam cipher. Sorry about the noise, but can you still hear me all right? But uh, uh, otherwise, I'm afraid we're all suffocating. We don't have rid of it. Um, you still have me all right? Yes. Right. Um, so the Lorenz Company was approached in order to build um, uh, to, to a machine uh, to try and generate this, this cipher. Now, a machine, as you well know, can't generate a, a random sequence. It's what's known as a pseudo-random sequence. Unfortunately for the Germans, it was more pseudo than random. <laughs> <laughs> and they achieved this by having wheels geared together to give a very, very long repeat cycle. Now, the, uh, the, the, nobody outside Germany knew anything about this Lorenz machine. And it's an amazing fact that uh, the first time the co-breakers saw a Lorenz machine was right at the end of the war, after the fall of Berlin, when, when Kesselring's machine, which I have in Bletchley Park, was captured and brought back to Bletchley Park, his communication convoy. That was the first time the co-breakers had seen a Lorenz machine but they've been breaking the code for two and a half years. And that's the story I want to tell as a starting point of this. It's an amazing story. Now, the first transmissions um, which the Germans sent out in Cyphered using the Lorenz machine were actually sent out uh, using uh, Hellschreiber, uh, which is a, a, a method of uh, transmitting um, rather like a, a sort of a telex system. Um, and, and, um, and that's what it looks like. Is not quite as simple. It can be got better than that makes sense that sort of thing. Now, these were, this is one of the very first uh, intersections, uh, and uh, uh, what you can see here is that there are a series of, 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 of names at the front here. There's um, uh, Gustav and uh, um, Gustav again, Ludwig. And what they realized after a short while was that there were actually um, 12 um, names at the start of every transmission. Um, and that these were taken from this set of names, and they produced that, in fact, that was just a method of ensuring that the first letter of each of those words was correctly sent and interpreted. So they, 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 they recognized that there was a group of 12-letter indicators at the start of a message when it was sent. Now, uh, the, the first link which they intercepted um, it was actually uh, a link between uh, Vienna and Athens, as they're using Hellschreiber. And um, because it was, uh, 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 this was in, uh, in, in late 1940, uh, early 41, and then they gradually increased the usage of the link, 
Um, and they called this name Tunnic because the generic name for this telegraphic code was the fish code. And uh, they called this particular one Tunnic, not knowing what it was, but they called it Tunnic. Um, the, uh, the, what they found was that uh, some of these messages, on some of these messages, the indicators, these, these 12 letter indicators, were the same. Not very many, but a few of them. And um, uh, they correctly deduced that the indicators were probably some method of, of showing to the uh, receipt to the operator at the receiving end the settings that were being used for a particular uh, transmission. So uh, if the two indicators were the same, that could mean that the machine settings were the same on those uh, particular transmissions. And, um, uh, and, and that was uh, one of the ways that they started to uh, try and work out uh, what this was. And uh, the way that was done with, is with um, what is called a depth. And a depth is where um, two transmissions are made uh, with the same uh, cipher machine settings. In other words, uh, they knew this was an additive cipher. They deduced that. Um, but they didn't know what the machine was that was generating the obscuring characters, um, but they could deduce that uh, with a, if the indicators were the same, then the sets of obscuring characters were the same, uh, but of course the main <coughs> sets were, were different. But uh, what helped them there was that uh, the Germans at that time, as they were with Enigma, were using um, uh, very standardized uh, forms of messaging, uh, which of course you should never do, but they did. For instance, most messages started with spoke number, um, message number, to start with. Uh, or otherwise, it started with um, with this sort of control characters um, to, to get the machines, uh, the, the paper in the right place, and the line feeds and so on, before they sent spoke number. So these were the sort of starting uh, points which, uh, which were on most messages. And so uh, when they got a, a message which was in, which was in depth, um, then, they could, uh, uh, then they could guess what these first uh, strings were, and begin to, to, to work out what the obscuring characters might be. But of course, that only got them as far as the, uh, as the length of the possible crib that they could deduce at the start there. But at least it showed that they were on the, on the right track. We're thinking it was an additive cipher, um, and, uh, and, and that it was, uh, and that it, it, it was uh, a bit of the sort of one uh, of Gilbert Burnham's system. So by the end of, um, uh, of, of July, um, they had uh, uh, they had did a 41. They had deduced it was an additive system, and then um, they had the, the stroke of luck, um, which is essential to all cipher breaking, um, and, and that was a, a, a terrible mistake uh, made by the Germans. And uh, this is a, an absolutely classic example of, of, of one mistake which opened the window onto everything. It's known as as the Z mug. And that is because the 12-letter uh, indicator of this particular message is that. And it's this very famous one. The last four letters are Z mark. And uh, this was the one which revealed uh, all, as I'll explain. Now, what happened was that um, for this particular message, it was on the Athens um, to, uh, 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 to, to Vienna Link. Um, the operator at the sending end had a long message of 3,976 characters to send. He elected to keep them in by hand, which I wouldn't have done myself, but he did. Um, and uh, so he correctly set up his, did whatever machine this was, but he didn't know at the time, the rent machine. Um, and he then indicated this by, to his operator at the other end of which settings he was going to use by sending this indicator group here to the other end. The other operator then put his, wheel, his machine in exactly the same um, start condition, and the guy at the sending end started to key in his message. Um, when he got to the end of this long string of characters, the operator at the receiving end sent back in German the equivalent of, didn't get that, send it again. <laughs> and then, like idiots, they both put their Lorentz machines back to the same start position. One of the fortuitous happenings at which the Lorentz company put on this machine was a little button which enabled you to go back to the same point again. Uh, that was a disaster. Um, so they put the machines back to the same start position. And then the operator at the sending end um, started to rekey this long message by hand again. But this time, uh, now if he'd been an automaton and he'd used exactly the same keystrokes as he used the first time, then all the interceptors would have got would have been two exact copies of the inciphered text. 
because the input text would have been the same, the machines were trundling around, generating the same obscuring characters, therefore the cipher text would have been the same. But the operator at the sending end, uh, being only human and being thoroughly pissed off, something like it, boy, <laughs> <laughs> started to make differences in his keystrokes. And the crucial difference happened quite early on here. The first time he, uh, he keyed in uh, Spruch Nummer Neun. The second time he keyed in Spruch NR Neun. Same meaning, but from there on in, the input keystrokes were different. But the machines were chundling away, generating the same obscuring stream of characters. Now, and what that meant was that when these two messages were intercepted in Knockholt and Kent uh, by the radio operators there, um, they, they saw the, the indicators were the same on the two messages, realized the possible indication of this, sent them post haste to Bentley Park, and there uh, Brigadier Tilton took them up and he was in charge of these operations. He was one of the chief co breakers of Bentley Park, the World War I co breaker. And, uh, and he realized the significance of this because what he realized was that because this is an additive cipher, if, having got uh, these two in cipher uh, texts here, if he added those uh, together, uh, character by character, he would end up with a series of characters, each character of which represented the two language characters. Because if he added those two in cipher strings together, this time, the machine trundling away is giving the same character every time. So those will disappear this time by the magic of modular tourism. And what he's left with then is a series of characters, each character representing the two characters of the text. Now, um, as they found on previous depths, um, normally that is unbreakable because of the, diff the difficulty of predicting what the next language character is and so on. That's quite almost impossible to do. But because of this unique characteristic, this was basically the same message, only punctuated differently, after about 15 days of, uh, of mental steam, he was able to actually recover both of these texts. By a feat, but he was a genius. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, at the end of those 15 days, he recovered both of these texts uh, by this method, and the second text was about 500 characters shorter than the first one. Um, so he knew then which, which uh, text fitted which of the encipherments, which is always a problem as well. So the, he was then able to take each of the texts away from the, uh, the enciphered received text, and this time the key stream was revealed. And there it is. And that is the key stream being generated, the obscuring key stream being generated by this machine. Didn't know what it was, but that's what it was. That's what the key stream was. And that's written out there as patterns here. See, and that's, these are the letters. So there's the key string. A few, um, a few uh, slight uh, difficulties here and there, but on the whole, um, about 3,800 or so characters of good, clear key. And of course, that was a, a, a code breaker's uh, uh, bonanza. Um, but it wasn't quite as easy as that, because obviously the, the machine generating this cipher was fairly complex. Um, and they struggled with this for a while. And then it was given to a gentleman called Bill Tutt. Uh, before I do that, I'll just show you a slightly uh, longer extended version of, of that. And there's a bigger chunk of the whole of, the, of this particular message there. Now. And that's actually um, written out by um, Brigadier Tilton when he was giving a lecture um, in 1960. Um, now, that, uh, this, this length of pure key, um, what they were trying to find out was what mechanism might be behind uh, the generating of this particular long string of, uh, of the key. And uh, the, the research section had no luck at with this at all, and then Bill Tutt came on the scene. And Bill Tutt was a young uh, graduate, uh, recently come down um, from Cambridge, and um, he um, came to Lecture Park, uh, and there's his graduation picture there, um, and um, he, uh, it was, who was given this key string, he just turned the slide projector off just for a moment. I can talk about the slide and I think he's right in the back. Um, well, yeah, there's a few dollars, sorry, it's the other dollars. Um, so he, he was given this long key stream and he started to, to write, write out these lengths of bit pattern at various periods. And what he found was that, in fact, if 
he wrote uh, one of these out, K1 out, or the points one stream out, then he began to get patterns appearing at repetition of 41. So 41 has some significance. So there he did, written out there at 41, and you can begin to see repeats of the same patterns there, which are certainly not random. Um, and so uh, he, he struggled with this for, for, for quite a while, and, um, and then he and the research uh, section between them, uh, he, he having got the first break, the research section, after about three months' work, had worked out logical structure of the machine which was generating uh, this sequence of obscuring characters never having seen one. And there it is. And what they worked out was that there were uh, the, the, there were 12 elements in this which fitted very well indeed with these 12 letters of the indicator. That's a nice clue that got into place. Um, and they realized that they were broken up into two groups of five and, and a group of two. And that they eventually worked out that these were actually, uh, probably they thought, wheels in a machine, because that's the way people would design machines in those days. Um, and it seemed reasonable that these were wheels, and that they had various periodicities. Uh, 41 was one of the ones they found, and so on here. And uh, they also soon realized that uh, these wheels, the first lot of wheels here, uh, generated one obscuring character. You have uh, an input character coming in here, transformed from serial to parallel, the bits then go through the machine, and underneath these wheels are cams, and they have uh, an XOR function which gives you the uh, modulo 2 arithmetic of the, uh, of the pattern standing under those wheels at that moment. And that gives you a, a, an additive character here, and then they, they deduced there was a second set of wheels here, and they had another ca character underneath those, and the result was finally transmitted. So the Lorentz with this machine, which they, they called Tunny, um, was in fact yet adding two characters rather than one to the input text before it was transmitted. But another complication was the, the period of movement of the wheels. Um, they, they deduced quite quickly that the first set of wheels here, and because um, uh, Bill Tuck was a mathematician, he called these the chi wheels, the psi wheels, and the mu wheels. Now, lesser mortals call them K, S, and M. Um, but uh, the, the, the chi wheels here, uh, they index one uh, love position uh, every time a character comes in, but the side wheels uh, stutter. And uh, the Germans had done this in order to extend the periodicity of the repeat um, of the machine. And um, they'd done this by making having two what were Richard Park called motor wheels. Um, and one of these was indexed every time a character came in. And then the second of those motor wheels only indexed depending on the cam setting on the first wheel. And the, the whole of the group of the side wheels only index depending on the setting of the lug on the second motor wheel. The Germans thought that um, gave them a, a much longer period and would make the cipher safer. In fact, it did just the opposite. By the fact of stuttering, it opened a window on the movement of the chi wheels. And that was uh, one of the major mistakes in the machine. Now, the, the other interesting thing is, so just looking at what the, uh, what the Lorentz machine does, um, it, uh, if you have that well-known German word behind, and uh, at that time the chi wheels have that on, then that gives that as the intermediate, and the, the psi wheels have that, that gives that as the output, and uh, the, the key stream is the sum of the chi wheel pattern and the S wheel pattern. So that's the way that the, the machine actually uh, works on a one on bit basis. Um, now, the whole pattern of z -Nug was produced by the research section uh, and built up, and, and there it is. There's all the patterns on the wheels there. Um, and uh, what is uh, quite amazing is there was one other factor which, uh, which made this absolutely unique, this opportunity of breaking this cipher. And that was that um, the Germans, their particular transmission, the Google transmission was just around that time, used a particularly bad pattern, set of patterns, for the psi wheels. And they never used those again. And what it is, is that um, if you look at the patterns for the psi wheels here, you can see very few singletons. Now, a dot means the wheel doesn't move. Uh, sorry, it, it means that there's a zero on the wheel at that point, so it has no effect on the, on the, on the character being generated by the chi wheels. So uh, it means that in that period there, the chi wheel pattern, whatever it is, will come through. And uh, so 
these th have got only one singleton on each of the side wheels. And the Germans realized uh, this was a mistake. They didn't realize what they'd done by doing it. And they realized it was a mistake. And thereafter, their patterns were, uh, were actually always with many more singletons than, uh, than, than not on the side wheels, which produced that effect very, very dramatically. But um, Bill Tutt has told me when I talked to him that he reckons that without that coincidence of the Germans using um, both the, 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 the double language, double message, and a bad sound pattern, he would never have seen that periodicity in the, in the Kai wheels, which enabled them to start breaking the cycle. But uh, uh, to start breaking it, they did. And um, a section was then set up under Major Tester in Bletchley Park. And um, it was called the Testery, as things happened in Bletchley Park. Uh, and that was in Hut 15, which is just uh, by Hut 3 here. There's now a piece of car park there. Hut 15 is gone. But that's where Major Testery was. And they started setting up uh, a section to, to hand break the, uh, the Lorenz uh, cyber. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then, uh, just to uh, jump a little bit forward in time sequence, uh, there is the Lorenz machine, and that's the one we've got in Bedford Park, and that is Marshall Kesselring's machine, and uh, this was captured, as I say, uh, just after the fall of Berlin, from Marshall Kesselring's communication convoy, and it was driven back to Bedford Park by a major tester. A major tester went out to, to Germany, and forced the German drivers to drive the, the whole convoy back to Bletchley Park. And there they saw this Lorenz machine for the first time. And here are the 12 wheels, the front of the machine here. They grouped in a group of five this side over here, and then two in the middle, and five this side. These are the high wheels, uh, the new wheels, and the side wheels over there. Now, uh, you can also see around the periphery of these wheels little mechanical lugs which have to be moved left or right by the operator and maybe the bit patterns in modern terms around the periphery of the wheel that the operators uh, had to set. Now, uh, another machine uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in this, uh, this was the uh, Siemens machine which was used by the German Air Force. Uh, that's not part of my story today. Uh, and it wasn't a particularly important machine. It was broken intermittently in Bletchley Park, but not regularly, because they concentrated on the Lorentz machine, because the traffic on that was so much more important. Now, uh, people coming into the, uh, into the testery, um, uh, obviously what this is all about, by trying to break it by hand methods, um, was, was being able to, uh, to mentally juggle um, bit patterns of characters. Um, and uh, this is the additional table for pairs of characters using the telephone code. There are 26 characters each side, and you have to learn that by rote. <laughs> and uh, the first thing anybody comes into the test, we have to do is uh, learn a copy of this from the bit patterns, work it all out, and then learn it by heart. And this one actually <coughs> is Doc Coombs's. Doc Coombs, just before he died, uh, gave me a lot of his papers, and that's the one that actually he wrote out. Um, when he joined the new um, to start to work on the machine. Um, so, uh, once they'd worked out the logical structure of the, uh, of the machines, uh, they then started to, uh, to attack them by, by hand methods. And uh, so, um, what they've done by, by, the, by January, uh, January 19, 1942, uh, Bill Tutt derived the Kai wheel sizes and then uh, by February, they determined the complete machine. And, uh, and then the, the Hellschreiber transmission ceased and they went over to 5 bit photo code. Um, and then in March 1942, uh, they broke Wosch, um, uh, and, and, and these are the two right back here. So they were running a year, just over a year, that is over a year late. And they finally managed, once they got the electrical information, to go back and, broke, and break those two depths there. Um, and then uh, they have one depth of three, which was uh, 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 the answer in, uh, in March. Um, and then uh, they say the, the attempts failed on that due to the change in the side patterns. Um, and and, and they, they, they then managed to deduce the, the periods over which these various patterns were in place. And what they found was that on this particular link, that's um, uh, uh, Athens to Vienna, um, the, the, the Kai wheel patterns were changed every month. The motor patterns changed every day. 
and the end of the side patterns change every six months. And they just uh, hit a six month change here, which uh, made that one fail to, to, to break. Now, having got the, the logic of the machines, um, they then um, they then they were then were able to start building um, some machines to to attempt to, um, uh, uh, to, to to actually do the deciphering, which was pretty horrendous by hand. And so they built these machines called Tunnic, which is a bit confusing, but they that's what it was. And the first of these was actually uh, designed by Frank Morell um, in, in 1942. And these are the Mark II Tunnies. Um, uh, Gil Haywood had quite a lot of uh, to do with the design of, of these later ones, but Frank Morell designed the original ones. And he used, uh, being a post office man, he used uniselectors and relays, uniselectors to simulate the wheels of this machine, not knowing what the machine was. And then uh, they could then have a machine which had the same logical uh, function as the diagram that they'd worked out as to how the machine worked. And so they could then use these tiny machines to actually decipher uh, the, the code much more quickly uh, once they worked out patterns uh, on the wheels. And what they also found, of course, was that not only were the patterns changed uh, at periods, which I've described, but also that the wheel start positions were changed for every message. And that was the killer. Um, it wasn't too bad having patterns changing because you could integrate those over a number of accepted messages. But the fact that the wheel start positions were changed for every message was a particularly difficult hill to climb. That's a 10 to the 19th combination to climb every day. Um, now, so they, they, they carried on a bit, but an analysis of indicators became the, uh, the, uh, the order of the day uh, at this, uh, this early time. They had no machines to help them apart from the tiny machine to actually. Um, so uh, the, they used indicators, and what they found was that they could pick up uh, cases where there was just one letter of an indicator which was different from another indicator, in other words, near, nearly the same, which just meant that one wheel start position was different. And by doing that, and using those sort of techniques, um, they managed to, uh, to, to get into current traffic by uh, the 18th uh, of July, 1942. And the first tiny machine uh, arrived in, um, in June 1942. And then uh, from July to October was the first golden age of tiny. And each month the, so the messages were broken by the 15th and current traffic was being read. And then um, uh, uh, Turing developed a, a method, a statistical attack method in August 42. And then at the end of October of 42, that first link closed down. And then disaster struck because the 12-letter uh, indicators were replaced by QSN numbers. And this just said QSN 43. And that meant look up your book and take the 43rd line, and that's your set of indicators. No cross-correlation, no, 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 no method, except you did know if the QSNs were the same number, then it was the same indicator, but you could no longer use these fancy tricks on near misses on indicators. So that, so set the whole thing uh, pretty well back. So, um, after the uh, uh, after the, uh, the death of the, of the indicator letters, um, in October uh, 1942, the, the Delta method was devised. Now, um, what happened with this was that um, the, the Germans had been, uh, been quite careful to make certain that their patterns used on the, on the wheel patterns um, made the, uh, the output text uh, on any particular bit stream flat random. And it really was flat random. It was exactly 50%. Uh, um, but uh, and they chose the patterns very carefully to do this. Uh, but what they hadn't realized was that, um, and what was realized in Bletchley Park in, in October of 42 was that in fact uh, they failed to suppress the, um, the very slight uh, indications between two wheels. If you use two wheels rather than just one, and also delta them, take the delta signal rather than the direct signal, uh, then the, the rest of the car realized you were in with a chance of, uh, of actually uh, getting a statistically significant uh, match on the, uh, uh, on the position of the wheels. And uh, this was picked up by Max Newman, who by this time had arrived in Bletchley Park, and he devised a scheme called Keith Robinson, the machine 
called Ephorism. It was called Ephorism because it was the Ephorism machine. Um, and what uh, Max Newman um, said was that if he took um, a, a key tape punched with pure key because the hand code breakers had got the patterns, what he didn't know was the positions of those patterns uh, to be used for a particular message. So uh, what Max Newman said is if he had a, a, a tape, paper tape punched with pure key patterns, uh, particularly the tie wheels of their tag first, um, then if he ran this tape in synchronism with the intercepted message tape and did this sophisticated double delta cross-reference between uh, pairs of bit streams on those two tapes, he reckoned there would be a significant bulge when this tape was in synchronism with the wheel positions used by the operator on that particular message. And he was right. Um, <coughs> Heath Robinson worked well enough, um, much foul language and torn tapes, but it worked long enough uh, to show that his theory was correct. Uh, there was a bulge uh, taken from pairs of wheels and using the double delta method. And, uh, and so then uh, Max Newman went to Dolly's Hill, and there he met Tommy Flowers. There's a picture of Tommy Flowers taken actually in this room here with our first uh, inauguration of the Colossus uh, uh, of the uh, Community Conservation Society um, a little of years ago. <laughs> um, anyway, there's, there's Tommy Flowers and uh, my shows. And now, Tommy Flowers had the absolutely brilliant idea of generating these bit patterns internally <coughs> in the machine. And that basically is the, is the whole essence of Colossus. What, he, what uh, Tom Flowers recognized was that you can generate these bit patterns with shift registers, um, and, uh, and, and they could be in valves, and, uh, and then you that did away with the, having the, the tape, which caused all the problems, and also, of course, you could also change the relative positions much more easily. Um, and so Colossus, the basic uh, the structure of Colossus is that you have now a single tape being read at high speed with an optical reader, just as um, uh, Keith Robinson was, but at very much faster speed. Um, and then you have the internal bit streams being generated uh, by rings of, 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 uh, of valves, and these are then combined with this sophisticated algorithm, and then the result is counted and, and read out. And that's the basis <coughs> of, of Colossus. Um, and there's the, um, uh, that is the simplified of Colossus. Um, and there you can see the various bits uh, of, of it, uh, uh, together with the internal bit stream generators, and I'll describe that in more detail as we go through. But um, and, and there, is, there is the machine. And there you have the, um, the paper tape loop uh, on here, which is used to, uh, uh, to contain the message tape, uh, going around at high speed, 5,000 characters a second, not hanging about. Um, continuously read, of course, not, uh, not stopped in the character, like some of the modern ones. Uh, but even so, it was a fairly fast speed, uh, using uh, optical uh, readers and hard vacuum photocells. Um, and um, uh, and that, that way, that was made into a continuous loop there, and continuously read. And it had to be done at high speed, because this was another exhaustive search. What you were doing was you were searching exhaustively for the start position, uh, which corresponded to the wheel settings on that particular tape. And if you used Tai 1 and Tai 2, you had to do 1,271 tries, in the worst case, uh, to get through all those combinations of the start positions of those two wheels. So it needed to go at very high speed. And that was what the process did, made at very high speed. And then these are all the compound circuits and the typewriter printing out uh, the, the result. And um, there's the, the famous um, uh, picture of the, of the lens, I'm sure you've all seen. Um, we have um, six contenders for the I'm the Lady there, and seven <laughs> contenders for I'm the Lady. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the, another view of the, of the machine um, showing the power packs uh, here. Uh, and then the, the internal, at uh, the back of the, of the racks, um, giving, the, um, uh, giving the power from rings there. And, uh, and here's all the rings. And of course, because there are 501 lugs on the Lorenz machine, there had to be 501 valves in this rack here. Um, those are, 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 are GT1C gas thyrotrons, which had the advantage over a flip flop that it's just one valve, because once it's struck, it sticks on. Um, and sometimes it doesn't always stick on. Um, but uh, the, the single valve uh, uh, 
a bit. Uh, it, the problem is that each of those uh, valves takes one and a quarter amps on its heater. So there's a fair amount of uh, heat there. Um, some of the young engineers who were, uh, were, were involved in servicing this machine were, were, were quite embarrassed to come round the back of this rack here and find that the wrens are trying to close line across the top of where the There's the, the, the valves used uh, inside the Colossus, uh, not a very good picture, but to EM36s, the, six, the GT1C power atoms, NATO 7s for pulling down the power atoms and quenching them. Um, uh, uh, six, six J5s and the uh, optical um, reader, which I'll talk about a bit later on, and the valve base. Um, the, uh, the, the ring patterns were plugged up in plug boards at the back of the machine, and, um, and, and they're done with little wire loops stuck through, uh, through, through pairs of holes. The rings uh, went round continuously. The whole thing was driven off of the, uh, the sprocket holes on the tape. So whatever speed the tape was going, that was the speed of Colossus. Um, Colossus uh, Tommy Flowers in his early days was a bit of a wag, and um, uh, one day, just for the hell of it, he um, got hold of the Variac, which controls the speed of the motor, and wound it up, and it went up to 9,600 characters a second before the tape broke and went everywhere at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> so he decided that, um, uh, that 5,000 characters a second was a pretty safe speed to run it at. Um, but of course, the, uh, the, 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 all these rings precessed round uh, at the speed of the, of the sprocket pole pulses, and uh, their start position is controlled by, by, by unit selectors. But of course, then you pick off the bits that you want with these links, which gives you the pattern which is generated um, as, the, uh, as the ring progresses. Now, the overall timing diagram on Colossus is, is quite interesting. Um, as I say, the, um, the clock speed is, um, uh, is, is, is 5 kcs, um, and uh, the input uh, sprocket uh, pulse is uh, standardized into a 40 microsecond pulse, which leaves you with 160 microseconds. The data is all satisfied on the trailing edge of the clock pulse, and it then produces uh, at that time interval and standard output plus or minus 80 volts throughout the machine. These, um, uh, this, is, this then propagates through all the logic circuits doing all these comparisons between the bits coming off of the tape and the bits coming off of the bit stream generators. And um, at the leading edge of the next sprocket hole, the result is sampled, and that is what is counted. So it's a very elegant and simple system there. But what is interesting is you can actually get up to 100 Boolean logic gates in here gate propagation is about 1.5 microseconds. And this is just using RF pentodes and fairly standard sort of stuff. It's quite remarkable. Um, and uh, so it's a very powerful machine to do. Now, uh, the, one of the heart of the thing is the counters. And the counters um, are bi-quinary counters, following on Wim Williams's his work um, uh, at uh, after one of them for the war. And uh, it's divided by two circuit, followed by a ring of in a five, um, and then uh, there are the various logic comparison circuits uh, on, on there as well to be able to compare a count with some preset count that you're going for. <coughs> Decade counters, the, um, uh, the, the, the gas uh, triode circuits had to be quite complex. Um, there's uh, part of it, and I've got a slightly uh, more overall drawing of it uh, here, uh, there. And uh, the difficulty is, of course, that you actually have to have uh, everything uh, divided into odd and even, because you have to strike a thyroton, and then the next time round, you have to strike the next one and, 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 and uh, unstrike the one you just struck. You have to unstrike it by pulling its anode uh, down the ground or something negative. And so it has to have two, two complete circuits um, flipping between the two halves here, but then there's an added complication if, as on the Lorentz, most of the rings are odd, you've got to have an odd one here, and you need another complete chain to handle just that odd case. So this is a very complicated circuit. It took me a considerable time to get that to work. Um, it does work extremely well, but once you've got it, it's all done. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that there were also um, delay circuits in Colossus. I haven't mentioned that, but um, uh, because of the need to do delta, um, 
in fact, uh, what you do there is you actually, uh, this, is a, this is for the data channels here, and so a data channel comes off of the paper tape reader, its status I guess changed in level um, to, to bring it to the plus or minus uh, 80 volt level, and then um, the output of this is, uh, is, is sampled on a particular time here, so it's sanitized on time, and then uh, the output of that is fed back into an integrator and then to another circuit, and so this gives a delayed pulse <coughs> here, the frequent <coughs> pulse, and, uh, and then the, those are also converged to give, uh, combined, to give the delta out. So this gives both um, Z and delta Z, the, the data channels are called Z, Z and delta Z out from there. And you could go up to five characters back, because um, what happened was that uh, the, the Germans uh, changed the characteristics of the of the tiny link. They they started off with the um, uh, with the machines as used in um, uh, in, um, in, in on, the, on the Vienna link, and then they gradually uh, introduced um, additional uh, problems. As I said, the delta method, which led to Colossus, uh, came in here, and then. Um, they introduced a, a, a limitation called uh, P5 2 back. And what that was, they, they made the motion of the side wheels dependent on the, uh, the, 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 the setting of wheel P5 two characters back. And of course, that has the, that has the effect of killing depths, because you can not get a depth out of, out of this at all. Um, but the upside was it caused so many problems for Germans because one small corruption in that propagated. Whereas before they put in that limitation, um, every character stood on its own and uh, was not never carried forward. Uh, once that limitation was in, if you got a corruption, the whole message became corrupt and it caused so many problems that, uh, that, that they, were, that they, they stopped doing that. And then um, the, um, uh, so, they, so they stopped doing that and then uh, they managed to, uh, in, in Vegetable Park, uh, to do very well in, in May 43, and this was before before Colossus came on screen. Um, 1.4 million was decoded by hand uh, uh, before uh, Colossus came on screen, and using uh, the uh, uh, slightly helped by the uh, defaults. Now, um, the machine age of uh, of Tunney, uh, the numerary was set up uh, in 742, and uh, the first uh, of the machines uh, arrived in April 43, and uh, he thought this was a in Hut 15A, <coughs> alongside Hut 15 on the Conway's piece of car park now. And then, um, as the work was obviously going to expand, um, in this enormous building, F block, which I showed you, which was at right at the top of the screen, with the red piece where it's been knocked down, um, that was built uh, in, um, in November 43, and I uh, moved into it in November 43, and the first Mark I Colossus was installed in F block, Christmas 43. And then um, the, uh, the, the, the Breen links broken and so on, so you can see it all here. Uh, and they tr the Germans tried different uh, limitations, but they were all overcome. And, um, and, 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 and by the end of, uh, by, the, by August 44, uh, they were producing uh, fantastic results in the breaking of the, of the codes. Um, as an example of what uh, typically happened, um, a German message uh, intercepted in 1944. Intercepted in the Nockholt, identified as Bree, that was the code name for Berlin Rome. Uh, good clear signal, recognized bottle depth. Uh, they immediately interpreted the first thousand characters to, to BP. Um, mm. Logged in, um, recognized as a previous possible as a previous logged in message. And then a section called Sixta, which was set up specifically to, to, to hunt for cribs, um, was, set, it was, was, was set to look for a possible um, crib. And uh, uh, room 41, and, uh, and then uh, the foundation of, of, of depth was proved. And then, if the message was on new patterns, then one of the top breakers uh, was, uh, was asked to see, uh, to, to, to try it and uh, get the message out. Get the wheel center, wheel pattern center. Um, and then, uh, if, if that was successful, then both messages were passed to the numerary for, for wheel braking and de on, on Colossus. Now, the, 
the, the one came up from knockout that looked like that. And, and that was one of the sheets that came up there. And I was uh, rather bemused by the fact that this was in five letter groups, because that's the way that Enigma uh, messages are always written out, because that's how Morse code is sent. And uh, of course, the teleprinter traffic is continuous. But this was actually explained to me by a lady who came in only um, three weeks ago, um, who was uh, what they called a Morse, uh, a slip reader. And what happened was that the, the intercepted message um, was always, first of all, inked onto an undulator. And that was the master copy. The Germans sent these signals with tone modulation, with two fingers of, of, of non-harmonically related tones, um, one for each for, for mark and space, uh, which were sent alternately. And um, so these were uh, decoded with filters and then used to, to, to move a pen recorder um, as the signal came in. And that was the master. And that was always produced uh, on intercepting the signal. Um, and that was always the master to which everything was referred back. Uh, later on, they did try directly punching the signal onto, um, onto punches, um, but they still did the other later tape as a backup in case there was a malfunction of the punch or anything like that. But this method, this visit of the five characters, was explained by the lady who then had to take this undulated tape and by, by eye read the characters and punch them onto a teleprinter. And she said, rather than going blind, what I used to do was to make a five character window uh, in a piece of paper and then run the, uh, run the tape behind this and do it five characters at a time. And so that's why there were groups of five characters coming out on the piece of paper. So, um, let's say these were intercepted at knockout, um, and, 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 and there it is, the, there were uh, 30 HRO receivers there, um, and at uh, both ends of the lake got the Germans work duplex, um, tone modulated carriers, um, and the undulated tape read by slip readers, um, and later direct tape punching drive. So, um, the, 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 this, these pair of messages arrive in the numerary, and the numerary first does a double delta run on Colossus. Um, that means it, it runs the, uh, the, the, the known patterns uh, against, uh, against the intercepted message tape uh, using the double delta um, uh, algorithm, and they decide on that, uh, for the, on the output of that, what are the best strategies for, for breaking and setting the kinds. Um, now, it's interesting that um, a lot of this, uh, the information about this latter stage of Colossus has only become uh, released in the last, uh, in the last year. Um, I mean, I've, I've only been allowed to tell this story since November last year. Um, and um, what's also happened is that um, the, because of the Freedom, Info Freedom of Information Act in America, uh, NSA, have been National Security Agency, have been forced to put into the public domain in the National Archives uh, all their wartime documents. About 5,000 documents went in about four or five months ago, and I have a list of, uh, of this very quickly, obviously, um, and looked down this and found, to my amazement, that there was a, a juicy title like The Cryptographic Attack on Fish. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I've been asked by DCHQ to keep some of this quiet, um, there it was, all in public domain. Um, so I rapidly got copies of these, and what happened was that these were reports written by um, United States service people uh, here at Second Fletcher Park, and then they wrote reports about the work here and sent them back to the States. And so there are two reports in there, which are uh, the, 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 whole, the whole thing, um, uh, written by servicemen, um, Small and Freed, who were seconded here to Fletcher Park, and as they wrote these reports. But what's interesting is their comments, because these are comments of people who were not involved in the original work, but came here as observers, and so they're actually quite important. And what they said, what struck them was the, uh, the systematic way in which the whole of the, of the tiny operation, the fish operation, was organized. Um, they said, for instance, that, um, that almost without exception, uh, the maths was always done before a machine was built. Uh, not exactly what happened in America. Um, uh, and, and also, that, uh, that the, 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 the rigidity of these criteria, which is why I bring this up, because um, what, you, what happened was that the messages as it came in were prioritized by, by HUB3, uh, uh, depending on what links they wanted to try and break, and so there were priorities of messages. Um, but despite these priorities, if a message uh, failed 
one of these early significance text, tests, it was dropped, quite independent of its intelligence importance, because they knew they couldn't break it. And the math was sufficiently rigorous to be able to say, if this particular run doesn't give this set of flags or this result, you're wasting your time to get it. And there was an absolute rule that, um, that no, uh, n nothing ever spent more than 12 hours on Colossus. It hadn't been broken by 12 hours, it was ditched. And very often, a, a short time in there. So, so there was a, 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 a great rigidity about, a, about the, uh, the maths, the, uh, the, the way the whole thing was structured, and the organization of the numerary and, uh, and the test tree as well. So they did these first tests. And if they decided that it was going to be possible to continue further, then um, the, the decai was sent to the, to, to the test to the test tree for breaking. And this is another important thing. In Bletchley Park, um, although it, it seems to us now, machines did not do everything. Everything was done by the stuff between the two. <coughs> machines just helped. Helped considerably, but they didn't do it. And it was the test tree which really was the cornerstone for the whole operation. And there, um, people would, would, I would say, they would have, they, there were people who would memorize this enormous <laughs> basic logic matrix. Uh, they, 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 were, they were anagramming and cluster uh, 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 puzzle uh, 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 enthusiasts and addicts. And they could uh, carry whole strings of bit patterns in their head and recognize when they were showing through and, and de and de the, the uh, and to get the breaking wheel settings. And because of that, the top people were, were really absolutely superb. And so uh, the, uh, the, the, the latter stages of breaking of the side wheels and the, and the, and the new wheels uh, were initially done by the test crew completely. Eventually, they did actually work out some methods on, on Colossus, which was mainly done by the, the test crew. And then, um, the, if, they, if that was successful, um, and the, uh, I said the best time for, for getting the most things out was 20 minutes, um, and, and the average time 90 minutes. That was a break in the, uh, uh, the, the most the science present. And then uh, sent to the tiny machine, this is the machine which actually emulated uh, the Lorentz machine. And there, uh, they plugged up and, uh, and decycled. And um, so, uh, so there, there it is. And, and the, the, eventually, the output was then sent to HUT, Hut 3, translation, that was a German output. And uh, uh, meanwhile, Sixta identified possible same messages, because very often on these links, and there are about 26 of these links, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, at this time, um, by that time they, uh, there were lots of messages flowing, flashing around, and very often the same message was, was re encyphered on another link, and so uh, uh, you got it in clear from one to the other. The, uh, uh, the best time from intercept to, to ultra, 24 hours, the average time, four days. Now this traffic was Absolutely stupendous. I mean, it was, um, it was uh, top grade messages between Hitler and his generals, literally. And these messages were very long messages, up to 30,000 characters long. Um, deposition reports of the complete uh, of, a, of, a, of a high command, uh, OKW or one of the other commands, about the whole of the division or whatever. So it was of immense importance. And um, particularly uh, before and, and just after D Day. Um, Colossus Mark I was operational in January 1944. Um, it was successful on its very first run in finding Kai positions against the real tape in February 1944. And to everybody's amazement, when the run was repeated, repeated the repeated results. Something still was required. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it, it was remarkable for the power of Colossus. And, um, and so it was operational. They immediately ordered the Mark II. Um, Mark II that I, that I built, um, and uh, uh, Tommy Flowers had had the foresight to see this coming and uh, ordered parts in advance, so he was able to meet the order, and um, the first Mark II was operational June the 1st. Um, it was scheduled to come in on June the 1st, uh, I'm told by some of the people who did it that he actually got working at 3 a.m. on June the 1st, <laughs> um, just in time for D Day. And um, it revealed that Hitler had swallowed the deception campaigns. Um, uh, the Phantom Army in the south of England and the Phantom convoys up the channel, and that Hitler was convinced that the attack was going to come across the Pas de Calais, and that he was keeping his panzer divisions in, in Belgium. It also revealed that he was telling uh, uh, Rommel to put his troops on the beaches, if Rommel wanted to do, and those sort of fragments of information 
uh, gave Eisenhower and Montgomery the confidence to go ahead with D-Day. After D-Day, the um, French resistance and the British and American air forces uh, bombed and starved all the uh, telephone lines in northern France and forced the Germans to use radio transmissions. So suddenly, the volume of radio intercepts increased enormously. Uh, luckily, Colossi were coming off the production line very quickly then, and uh, we were able to cope with it. Um, and by, uh, by, by the, the end of 44, uh, they were breaking about um, 1,200 messages a month. Um, that's uh, 300 a week of these very long, very important messages. Now, Colossus, as I said, uh, didn't, uh, just didn't actually decipher the messages. Uh, it, all it did was to find the real settings, and that was his 10th and 19th, now 25. Um, and the way it did it was to, uh, as I said, to, uh, um, um, to, to, to try a different wheel start positions. And here is a, a piece of Colossus output which has survived in a very unique way, the way some of these things do. Um, as I said, I got, uh, just before Doc Coopers died, I went to see him in Plymouth, and um, he gave me uh, a whole load of papers, which he shouldn't have kept, but he did it that year. Um, and uh, among these was a piece of paper with some circuit diagrams drawn on the back. And when I turned this piece of paper over, I found that it was a Colossus output that he'd torn off the typewriter and used in a piece of scrap paper. And that was the way the only known output of Colossus has survived. And there it is. And so here is the, the Chi-4 and Chi-5 wheels being run against a particular message tape. We don't know which one. And we don't even know the date of this. Um, but what is, you can begin to see the, the score here of the, of the cross-correlation measurement uh, between the patterns being generated and the data on the tape. And the peak is very weak. Uh, 1988 against 1947, 1945 there. And the code breaker had written in pencil on this piece of paper, um, 1705, as being the correct uh, wheel settings for Chi-4 and Chi-5. So that's an actual piece of process output. Now, uh, the, the ways in which Colossus was used uh, were, were, were large and varied. And here's um, part of the, um, the, uh, the, the decision diagram um, used by the Rens um, in, the, in the numeracy to decide what to do next and how to do it. And it's a very complicated system, as you can see. Uh, and it's got a band note down here. Uh, that to work. Um, so so that, that's a complete sequence of different different things that have to be tried. And we're only just beginning to, um, to put together uh, for the number of various reports we've now got um, how that was done and how it was plugged up on process and actually, actually run. Um, there's a, a sketch of the Tunney machine. Um, and this is an example of, uh, of how we've had to tease out um, the details about these machines. Um, this was a, um, an agreed uh, picture drawn by some of the engineers, uh, led by Ken Holton, one of the, of the engineers in Bletchley Park, um, and this was their recollection of what the tiny machine looked like. Um, we, about uh, six months ago, or more than that, um, we had a lady come in who was a, a, a WAF operator of tiny machines. She took one of the look at this and said, it wasn't like that at all. These were up here, those were down there, there wasn't one there, and that was over there. And so we, we redicted it. And uh, we eventually, uh, when we actually uh, came to, to build the machine, um, we found, after the, uh, those, that picture of the tiny machines that emerged from the GCF2 archives, we had, we had got it right in the end. Um, and that's the way we had to get to, to So the output of the tiny machine is something like that, which is a German, a German text output there. Um, the, uh, uh, so this is a, a German output from the tiny machine, and uh, there's a, a slightly uh, uh, enlarged version there. Um, this is a particularly filthy German word, which is put it at the start. <laughs> uh, um, the number of links uh, here um, was, was quite large, about 26 by the, by the end of the war, and there's some of them. And um, uh, of these, the, uh, the jellyfish was one of the, uh, one of the very important ones from Berlin to uh, on west of Paris, and, um, uh, and, and there's a, a codfish in, in Greece and so on, you know, uh, green in Rome. So these are all the links that were in operation. So there were about probably 150 tiny machines actually built. And um, as far as I know, there are only um, 
three survivors. For a long time, I thought the machine I had in Bletchley Park was the only one that had survived. But when some Americans came over from NSA um, about six months ago and said, oh, we've got two of those in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> they never told anybody about them at all. Um, anyway, I will see when I go to America next week and have a look at those. Um, so uh, that's the, the new memory which was built. Uh, this big block, uh, enormous block in, in Bletchley Park. Um, new memory in the testery here. And Colossus 1 came in, in there. Now, unfortunately, this block has been knocked down by British Telecom. Uh, the rest of these, um, and, uh, and it no longer exists. And that's an uh, um, H block. And the good news is that the H block does still exist. And, and that contained the remaining six of the Colossi. There were four in the numerary and six in there. And number nine was in this room here. And that's the room where I rebuilt Colossus. So the uh, numerary, um, the size of it, um, there's, a, there's a stark growth. And it ended up um, a total of 325 people. Um, uh, staff per shift is there, and so on. And then they had daily staff as, as, as well as, as shift workers. But it was a, a big operation. And the, um, the output was equally impressive. By the end of the war, this is in thousands of characters. That is 63 million characters deciphered by the end of the war. So, um, secret. Um, for reasons which uh, nobody actually knows, and it'll be interesting to find out one day, um, Churchill commanded that all, everything in Bletchley Park be destroyed at the end of the war. In fact, uh, eight of the ten colossi were destroyed in Bletchley Park, um, two went to East Coast, and they went, later all went to Cheltenham. Um, but uh, the remaining eight were all destroyed. All the bombs were destroyed, um, and, um, and all the other machines were taken out. And Bletchley Park was completely gutted, literally. Um, the, um, all the buildings were emptied. All the uh, underground uh, chambers were all sealed, and the entrances concealed. And we haven't found those yet. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and the whole place was gutted. So by the end of 45, uh, there was no vestige whatsoever of what went on there during the war. And because um, everybody who worked there was covered by the Official Secrets Act, um, the secret was kept for 50 years or more. And of course, that is a source of great amazement to the young people who come to Bedford Park, who can't imagine how a secret can be kept 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the attractions is, uh, for how on earth did people keep a secret? Um, so, uh, but it was kept uh, by all the people who worked there. And it was only revealed, first of all, by David Kahn in 1967 in his book, Code Breaking. Um, and that was just a passing reference to, to Bletchley Park as being the home of World War II Code Breaking. And then Jack Good uh, wrote an article in, in a magazine, in a, um, a journal, uh, describing uh, Colossus, but not naming it, describing the machine. And then Donald Mickey in 1962 named it. And then Brian Randall uh, came on the scene. And because he was writing a history of, of early computers, heard about Colossus, he started investigating it. He went to DCH to find out more details, uh, was given the brush off, but he did um, extract from GCHQ a promise that GCHQ would do their own internal history of Colossus, uh, which they did. And that uh, has finally come to me, and that was a, a, a great help. Um, and that was done by Don Hall. Um, and um, so Brian Randall uh, managed to get out of them some, some of the early pictures of Colossus and some of the details um, and uh, uh, published uh, in, in his book. And then, of course, the other details of Bletchley Park came out of the other uh, writers at that time. So uh, that was the situation um, in, with, with the, 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 the park. The, the present owners, um, by, by the end of the war, were uh, British Telecom and, 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 and the government. And that's the way the holdings were broken up. Uh, at that time. Um, British Telecom basically owned the bits around the outside, plus the mansion, and the government owns all of it in the centre. Here's the wartime buildings, uh, there's where the end block had been knocked down by them. Um, and, uh, and so those are the holdings. And then 
In 1990, the uh, present owners announced they were going to uh, leave the park, and their intention was to uh, knock down all the wartime buildings and sell the park for development for housing and supermarkets, which Milton Keynes leaves like a hole in the head. <laughs> and uh, Milton Keynes could do some history. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a number of us who, uh, who were aware of the significance of the place uh, got together in, uh, and eventually, in, uh, it started in 1990, and then in 1992, uh, we formed um, the Bletchley Park Trust. And uh, uh, the, uh, I, I was told by my um, uh, younger sons that uh, nowadays one has to have a mission statement. I'm not quite sure what it means to have a mission statement. And uh, our mission was quite simply uh, to save Bletchley Park for the nation, although the nation wasn't aware it needed to save them. <laughs> and so we set about uh, the, the task of, uh, of doing that. The original idea was that we would set up um, museums in the park. Um, uh, to technology, computing, the radar, and so on, and, uh, and, and get on with it. And we thought, well, this is going to be fairly easy. I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's an important site. Um, what's the problem? The problem, unfortunately, is British Telecom. Um, and British Telecom uh, have been the, the nigger in the wood pile right the way along. Um, their uh, only intent is of getting £10 million for their part of the park, and they have fought us tooth and nail for the last four years preventing us from getting on with this whole operation, um, which would be very sad indeed, because they could have come in behind us right at the beginning and got an enormous amount of kudos from preserving the site of the first computer and also all the other work that went on there. Well, they haven't, and it's still a long battle which will probably go through. Now, the, um, the way that uh, Roger Bristow and I originally structured the whole thing to work um, was just having come from the Science Museum here restoring old computers, um, I knew that museums uh, never get enough, enough visitors, they always need sub subsidizing. And so um, Roger and I looked at the, all the buildings in the park, and what we decided was that there are enough buildings in the park for us to have an adequate museum provision and still leave enough buildings to be let for commercial rent. Wartime buildings, refurbished, and let for rent. And that was the way we structured the whole project, uh, put it together in, in 19. Uh, 91, 92. Um, and the plan was that we would generate enough income from letting of those buildings to be able to set up the museums and run them in perpetuity uh, as, uh, as, as, as a foundation. Um, that uh, is still the plan, and we're still struggling to do it. But um, in, in the meantime, uh, what I have uh, managed to do is to rebuild the Colossus computer. And um, uh, as, as you probably know, the British Computer Society, the, the, we jointly formed the Computer Conservation Society with the Science Museum here, and, um, uh, and, and start, I started to restore uh, computers here at the Science Museum, and that gave me the idea that it was possible to restore, um, to, to rebuild Colossus. Um, unfortunately, um, the only information available was the wartime photographs of Colossus, um, uh, the eight photographs that have been preserved in 1945, and um, a few circuit diagrams, which engineers have kept quite illegally, as engineers do. And a few bits also kept illegally. Um, so the first job was to pour over the photographs and produce um, CAD drawings uh, of, the, of the machine uh, using some rather sophisticated 3D protection. And I emerged uh, with that as the answer. I mean, the first question I asked designers, engineers, and operators was, how high were the racks? Oh, well, they were somewhere in there, and somewhere around about that sort of height. Um, so I had to do all this working out in order to get down to the height of the racks. Um, the saving grace in this has been that uh, Colossus, having been designed and built at Dolly Still, used standard post office components. And um, the post office being what it is, nothing much changing for the years. So I'm able to go out, able to go out and raid exchanges which have been decommissioned from uh, Stroud to digital. To digital and rescue all sorts of components like uh, plug panels and switches and, and unit selectors. Um, and, and those are, are still exactly the same as they were in the day of Colossus. And so the, I was able to work out the dimensions from them. And then uh, worked out the, uh, the optical uh, the, the bedstead, which had, which had a paper tape on it. And, um, and also the... Uh, now I was helped in the, in the optical reader uh, by, uh, by getting into contact with Dr. Arnold Lynch, who was the man who designed the optical reader in 1942. Um, 
and he's uh, 86 now. He came up to my house in Bedford, and we spent a happy afternoon with my uh, CAE system re-engineering re the whole of the optical system. Because this depends on uh, the photocells. And the photocells, when Tommy Flowers uh, wanted hard vacuum photocells in order to be able to read at high speed, um, he came across um, a large store of 10,000 which had been manufactured for proximity fuses in shells. And these have an axis of symmetry, they've got cones in them, so they can be mounted in the nose of a shell, spun round, and when they see a shadow, boom, that was the idea. Um, so there were 10,000 of these manufactured, hard vacuum cells, um, uh, where they found the product didn't work, and so these were sitting in a box. And so Tommy Flowers acquired these, <laughs> but of course the, uh, the, they then mounted them in optical valve bases um, in order to be able to plug them in, and, and, and there, there they are there. Um, and of course the spacing of those valve bases there determined the optics of the whole of the system. So having worked out the optics with uh, uh, with, uh, with with with, uh, um, uh, with Arnold Lynch in the best engineering tradition, I then built a mock-up of it, and, uh, and there it is, and it worked. Um, and we have a little drum here with paper tape on, and a, and a car headlamp bulb under my 97MG in there, and, uh, and, and, and the photo cells and the mask, and, and that proved we got the length and the dimensions right, and so on. So having got the dimensions right, um, I then started to actually build the. Uh, uh, the frame, and there it is. The uh, Colossus Rebuild project was uh, inaugurated by His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent, who opened the museums that we set up in Bentley Park in July 1994. And he came into this room here, and on the floor was just a heap of steel, and he gave the Royal equivalent of best of luck. <laughs> 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 and, and anyway, that, a short while after, we had this uh, this great assembled, and, uh, and, and that was able, we were able, then able to get the uh, uh, paper tape reader system uh, up, and, and there's the, paper, the first test paper tape reader system using two two reels off of a uh, off of a, a baggage trolley and a, a vacuum motor um, and, and the lens and so on. And so that tested out the system and proved it all worked. And then um, we had to manufacture the uh, uh, had to manufacture the wheels and these um, uh, aluminium wheels uh, here. And that was where uh, my colleague Chris Burton came in on, on this, um, who some of you probably know. Um, he, uh, uh, we had this problem of how we're going to do this. He's, he has a, a lathe of sufficient capacity to be able to handle this. Um, but we thought we were going to have to pay um, uh, for, for a slices of aluminium and then uh, machine them out of, the, uh, out of that. Um, and we, when we went on inquiry, we found it's going to cost us about 25 pounds sterling a time for a slice of aluminium to do each wheel. And then uh, Chris came across a, a jobbing founder in Telford, and uh, this chap makes uh, horse brasses and uh, things for, for fairs and so on. And uh, Chris happened to come across him, and he asked him whether he could possibly cast something like this. And the chap said, yeah, I think so. It would be a wooden mould, and I'll do it. And um, uh, Chris said, well, how much would you charge us for it? I'll probably have to charge you five pounds worth. <laughs> 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 uh, so uh, Chris rapidly rushed home and produced a wooden bowl. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually cast these, and they're very good castings. He said, oh, I, 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 there was a bit more than I thought, so I'll, I'll have to charge you six pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so we got the castings, and then uh, Chris Burton machined these on his, on his lathe. Um, and they're, they're an excellent job, and, um, uh, and they work extremely well. Um, so that's, that's got the paper tape reader system. Um, now, I think that, that rather than, than, than plow through, um, through, through lots of, uh, of, of photographs there, uh, what I'll do is I've just got a, a few slides to show you on the, on the slide projector and then we'll look at the video. So, um, uh, Tony, this is a natural break. Is it, could I ask anybody who's got a seat by them to raise their hand if there are any uh, empty? There's three there, three. everybody wants to sit down. <laughs> that's the uh, well known figure of Colossus. Um, that's the paper tape um, with the, the holes punched in it, because you have to indicate to Colossus the start and finish of, of a loop of tape. And this was done in a very elegant way um, by actually having offset holes uh, between the tracks of the holes on the wide side of the tape. And the uh, the stop the start hole is between tracks three and four, and the stop hole is between tracks uh, four and five here, and that's uniquely sensed by a particular kind of photo It's 
quite remarkable that um, in, in, in a tape of, of, of 10,000 characters, you can pick out one hole just like that. And there's the, the punch that does that. That belongs to Harry Fenton, and he's not part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's the process I see. Uh, that is the ghost of F block. Uh, F block was knocked down in 1987 by um, British Telecom. Uh, one of the telecom engineers was so incensed at this being done, he actually took a video of this which I had in my back pocket, which I could use at some time if I had to. Um, and, uh, and this was a, 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 before it was just destroyed. This is the arch over the road across joining the two linking bits in the in Bexley Park. So, um, Switch that uh, off, please. That vector off, please. Okay. Uh, so now I'll play the video of the um, uh, of, 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 uh, more or less have an issue. Um, the result was a, a panel which was pretty tatty, and um, in my days at Marconi, I was known as the Blur's Nest expert, but I haven't changed very much. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so it was a pretty poor state. We had um, re uh, re uh, built a, a, a replacement panel which had been wired but never tested. And in a typical arrogant sale manner, on the on the Wednesday before the Thursday royal switch on, on the morning I decided I was going to change the control panel. Um, so I took the old one out, put the new one in, and then started to debug it. Um, I finally got it working at quarter to twelve on the Wednesday night and before the switch on on the on the sixth uh, of, of, of June. Um, and then uh, it, it actually did it work, as you saw there, much better what it believed. Um, but then uh, the next day, when I, I was still sort of stoned out of my mind trying to get, get over it all, um, one of the engineers who helped me came in and switched the Colossus on. And the first thing that happened was the paper tape broke. <laughs> and that paper tape had been on there for four months. So that was very lucky. Um, and then when I came in the following morning, nothing worked at all. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. The optics were way out. There were no signals on the, on the, there were no signals on the rings. There was nothing happening at all. It took me about 10 days to actually get process working again. So I was extremely lucky. <laughs> um, I would uh, like to give, uh, tell you a little bit about the project to rebuild the, um, the Turing box. But I think uh, perhaps we can have a few questions on the process. about what drove their decision making? Um, yes, it was, um, it, it was uh, just the, the, the German uh, code builders uh, feeling, that, as with Enigma, which is why they put the fourth wheel on, that uh, they knew that if the traffic density increased above a certain point, then the cipher that they had became susceptible to attack. And so it was a preemptive measure rather than a reactive measure. Um, but the Germans were so convinced of the security of the of the Lorentz cipher, but on at least two occasions, they sent the ne next month setting sheets over the link, and they were broken. <laughs> <laughs> My question uh, was essentially the same. That there does seem to be a competition between the English and the Germans, uh, the sort of knowledge of how far ahead they would need to be. <coughs> yeah, so presumably, that they could not have 
uh, I managed to acquire um, a considerable <laughs> number um, from good people who kept them. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things is that in Bletchley Park, we have a, a, our own venue amateur station in GB2 BP, and um, uh, they, they broadcast uh, uh, cries uh, for, for vowels made all over the world. So I get little packages arriving from Canada and New Zealand and Australia containing <laughs> two or three vowels, and I've managed to build up quite a collection that way. Um, but in order to, uh, to complete, for instance, the Thyrotron rings, um, I suddenly needed 600 Thyrotrons to have some spares, and so I had to go out and buy those. And uh, luckily a commercial company came and sponsored me to do that. Um, but there are people who, there are dealers who've kept uh, wartime vials as an investment, and they've got thousands, of these, hundreds of thousands of these vials, so there isn't the difficulty in getting vials, you just have to pay for them. <laughs> What's the total wattage of Four and a half kilowatts. Mostly in the um, All of the books I've read, so you mentioned them, are really a popular view of what went on. Where can one find the detail that you've already covered today? I'm still writing the book, I'm afraid. Further <laughs> 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 to that, um, casually, one can't um, avoid uh, not get it to hearing the credit given to various people. Newman, Turing, and lots of others. But the figure of Alexander is very shadowed. He, he's terribly famous as a chess player, and yet he's all I knew him for 20 years, 30 years as a foreign officer. I mean, has anyone published anything about his, anything about his contribution? Oh, yes, it is. The, his, his contribution, the two Alexander's contribution, is, is well mentioned in, uh, in books like you know, the Hut Six Story and so on. Um, and it, it is well documented, and it was a very strong contribution. And it was to Enigma rather than the rest, which is why I personally haven't mentioned it very much there. Sorry, what was the Enigma? I think most of the Romans are already here. But, uh, Enigma, was Enigma was the other, was the other German, main German code system. And was it uh, hard built, hard wired, uh, new coals and things like that? Yes, it was, it was a mechanical machine, an extra set. Yes. Why is everything still so secret? Yeah, well, I, 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 was, I, was bit, I, I was a bit amused by this because when I, when I approached ECHQ um, three years ago to start this project, they said, oh, well, eventually, they said I could, I could build the hardware because they had to agree that would all be classified. Uh, but I couldn't talk about the, uh, the algorithm to use, and I couldn't connect across us up, and I couldn't show it working. Uh, but um, uh, in order to um, suss this out, I got myself fully security clearly here because of the surprise that I've worked for my five and a half years, so I had the clearance. And, um, I went and argued with them inside. And the answer is that the code-breaking technology developed at Bletchley Park um, in the 40s was so light years ahead of anything that had ever been done before that it's still being used today. And that is the reason why they're very resistant to That's the reason Churchill never went Is it? Very wide back. Yeah, lots of Russian people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, may well be, yes. Um, well, I just felt time is rather yeah. running on. Yeah, but, uh, right. Some of us would like to hear about the bomb rebuild, but I did wonder whether we ought just to have a break so that those who wanted to get out could. And then if you wouldn't mind staying on and use the room for a bit longer, then perhaps we could say a bit about the bomb rebuild project, which is going to be uh, a very difficult one to the very important and very interesting one. Before that, can we say thank you to Tony for, not just for this wonderful lecture, but for the sheer bloody get on and do it that he's displayed in this wonderful rebuild project. Thank you. every other weekend. Yeah. Uh, the uh, cryptology trail is extremely interesting. You can see the machines there. You can learn a whole lot about it. Finally, you can see Colossus uh, working. I can assure you it's absolutely fascinating to see it in those buildings where uh, all those years ago uh, that astonishing team worked.
Uh, well, I suggest we take a five-minute break and then perhaps... Uh, with a, a picked up of the work of the Polish co-breaker, uh, Maria Radievski, who designed a thing called the Chief which Greg Radievski called a bomba. Um, the name is rather obscure, but one story I like is that the Poles were eating an ice cream in a restaurant in Warsaw when they had the idea, and they called it a bomba. Uh, anyway, uh, Turing took up the idea and anglicized it to bomb, the O-M-D-E. The original, um, uh, original uh, Polish versions uh, exercised the equivalent of six uh, Enigma sets of rotors, um, whereas this is the Turing one has got 36. And the idea of this was that it um, exercised rotors around continuously searching for a combination of rotor positions, um, which, uh, which translated a, a particular piece of interceptive text into uh, a crib, which the co-breakers had, uh, had worked out. Um, and uh, uh, so Terry designed the, 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 the actual bomb, um, and there's a picture of the, uh, of, of the back of it, uh, with all the wiring on the back, the down the wall and so on. And these were operated by the, the rent. Um, what, um, uh, uh, what Gordon Welchman and Turing realized was that um, whereas the uh, Enigma rotors are actually uh, uh, single rotors uh, where the current flows in on one side and out the other, you actually need to expand these to double-sided rotors so you can separate out the input and the output connections. Now, uh, when I was faced with the problem of, um, uh, of trying to decide whether it was possible to, uh, to rebuild a bomb, and that we're in worse condition with this than uh, the Colossus because there are very few photographs of it. Uh, the first thing I had to do was to decide was to find out how the bomb actually worked. And on reading the, um, the manuals about this, uh, I decided that the people who had written the manual, the, the books rather, had not really understood it. And so, um, <laughs> in, in the best, in the best of computer engineering tradition, I built a simulator of the, uh, of the bomb, uh, first of all of the Enigma machine, and then of the bomb. Now, the way that the, uh, the, the, the bomb is actually used is by what's known as a menu. And um, the menu is basically a transition diagram between the intercepted German text and a crib, which happens to be a complete crib here, uh, which is what the code breaker thinks that this represents. And what he's trying to find out is the rotor positions for the three rotors and the, uh, and the ring settings uh, which the German operator used, and the Steckerbohr connections, which the operator used for this particular message. And so this uh, transition diagram is constructed, um, and that depends on chains of letters, where letters go you know, in a chain like, for instance, um, uh, where are we? S, S to E and uh, 17, and then um, uh, Q to E at, at 12 there, and so on. You find these positions, and you construct these rings, and that's a menu. And that's what's plugged up onto the, onto the bomb. Um, and um, the, the bomb is plugged up uh, like, like that with the, um, these double-ended rotors and the diagonal board. And uh, here is that particular menu which I've uh, indicated there, uh, <coughs> Q to position 12, Q to N. So the red puts onto this the rotor, these rotors um, uh, here and then sets them to these uh, relative positions and then uh, plugs up at the back the connections um, to the registers at the back of the diagonal board and then allows the machine to churn away and, uh, and look for a result. And something which, um, uh, which, the, which Turing and his, and his friends and Gordon Lodgman could never see is exactly how this works. But the, one of the advantages of a simulator is that you can actually see it working. And here it is. This is the first time anybody's ever, well not the first time, this is the first time I've shown it, uh, demonstrated this. Um, and that is, here are the registers um, on, the, uh, on the Turing bomb. And the great thing about the Turing bomb was that it, uh, Turing realized that if you have a search tree with a starting point and 10 to 20 leads, which is what the, the Enigma machine has, then uh, rather than go down this tree looking for the one answer, Turing realized it was far better to go down the tree and prune off all the branches which couldn't possibly happen. So his, his, his way of doing it was to reject all the impossible hypotheses and end up with something at the bottom which you couldn't reject. And this is exactly what the bomb does. Um, what it's churning around here is going around the registers here, and it ends up at the bottom here saying that with this set of connections, uh, I cannot reject the hypothesis that L is stecker to L, um, U to J, 
or u to u, and y is either h or y, r to q, and so on. So it ends up with that set of set connections, and those are the ones the bond cannot reject on what you've given it. And so then you put that back into your uh, Enigma machine and try and get the answer out again. And rather than having all the stickers, you've now only got uh, two of them uh, resolved. And what happens is that okay, what comes out is very nearly the original German text. And from that, with a bit of uh, mental agility, you can work out the remaining of the state connection. So that's how the, uh, the, the bond works. And that's how my simulator does it. Um, the interesting thing is that the simulator, which actually works exactly correctly with, as, a, as a Turing bomb did, um, takes 18 hours on a modern Pentium 100 megacycle PC <laughs> <laughs> to do what the bomb did in 15 minutes. <laughs>